Before we start, if you're enjoying these conversations, please make sure that you like or subscribe to Cleaning Up. It really helps other people to find us. Cleaning Up is brought to you by Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gilardini Foundation. Hello, I'm Michael Liebreich, and this is Cleaning Up. My guest today is Jonathan Porritt. He's a longtime environmental campaigner, he's a writer, he's a founding member of what became the Green Party of the UK, and he's a founding director of Forum for the Future. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan Porritt to Cleaning Up. Jonathan, thank you for joining me here. Very nice to be here. On your sofa. On my sofa. Exactly. Um, I'm a bit worried, of course, because uh, those who are watching on um, you know, on YouTube will see the bottom part of a, yeah. a Union Jack, and they might think that my sofa is this sort of um, uh, jingoistic shrine. So I'm just going to show people um, <laughs> what actually happens up there. If I just tilt this back, then they should be able to see. It's actually a suffragette flag original there we go votes for women so it's all incredibly on message for what we're going to be talking about yeah uh, and now you can these... see the buggered up the camera position so no i'm not sure i think that's fine that okay? we'll, we'll survive <laughs> um, i'll tilt it a little bit down and we'll survive <laughs> so jonathan thank you very much for joining me here yeah. uh, on cleaning up um we first met i'm gonna say 2000 and eight, nine, for, we were working with um, the Zaid Future Energy Prize. And I think you were, uh, you were chairing one of the, one yes. of the panels and I, yes. was, uh, I was on it, I believe. You were, uh, yes, I was chairing it for a little bit. Um, chaired the, not the first one, but the two or three after that. And it was, uh, it was always a bit of a surreal role for me, to be honest. I mean, flying out to Abu Dhabi twice a year to chair a panel looking into the future of energy systems when you're sitting on the world, one of the world's largest puddles of gas and oil is, was very surreal. But we did have some quite lively conversations, Michael, you will no doubt recall. We, we <laughs> did, and you know, when I, because I, I ended up being very involved over a number of years. I ended up yeah. helping the, uh, the jury with their deliberations. And, and of course, you have a question when you're invited to do this is, you know, it is Abu Dhabi, they are sitting on these enormous uh, oil reserves. Yeah. And then the first question you have is, is this, um, is this sincere? Is it greenwashing and, or is the prize and, and the philosophy behind it sincere? And I sort of decided that it was and therefore I was okay to, you know, to, yeah, to, no, to felt, be involved. I felt in they were genuinely yeah. sincere. I didn't feel manipulated or used in any respect during the, whatever it was, eight years or so that I did it. I thought they were acting in good faith, even though you couldn't put away the surreal sense of what was really going on in the economy as in that economy as a whole you just couldn't put that away completely but i think in one way it was really interesting because you know we talk about the transition and the transition yeah. is a you know 20 30 40 or 50 year or longer process and i have no doubt that it'll be done by the end of the century and the question is how long will it take it is not an abrupt stop of, of all the bad stuff and an immediate start of all the good stuff. It is a transition. So when you actually spend time in places yeah. like Abu Dhabi, that are really trying to, you know, to, to, to navigate this very difficult, you know, the decades in between, yeah. uh, it was quite an education, at least I found. Yeah, I think they are genuinely trying to navigate the, the, the decades in between. I think many other oil producing countries have absolutely no intention whatsoever of getting on board with that navigation. Their primary intent as far as i can tell is to delay the inevitability of that transition for as long as possible and use every single tactic at their disposal to do exactly that however much it costs them and however many politicians they have to buy in the process so i think i do think abu dhabi is is different in that regard but i wouldn't write that as a kind of commendation for the integrity the moral integrity of the rest of the uh, many oil producing oil and gas producing countries well, when we're filming this, obviously, it's a six-month mark of the uh, Russia's aggression on Ukraine. Yeah. So when we talk about moral integrity of their Indeed. climate action, I think uh, at the moment we have some even bigger moral Indeed. integrity issues Indeed. with Indeed. some Indeed. of the uh, oil-producing nations. But um, just bring me up to date, because I've not seen you in the flesh mm. um, it's got, to be, it's got to be certainly before COVID and yeah, possibly no, quite a few years yeah. before then. So what are you currently working on? I'm still spending most of my time with Forum for the Future, the organisation you mentioned in the intro. 
that's three days a week for me. And that means I'm still doing quite a lot of work with Forum's biggest, um, some of Forum's biggest global partners, um, including Unilever. We get ourselves involved in lots of uh, interesting and feisty issues, which is the bit that I like about sustainability when it's contested and not obvious and not black and white. It's the gray areas in between that I'm intrigued by. And beyond that, I'm still doing quite a lot of campaigning work, very involved in different anti-nuclear campaigning organizations, for instance, involved in working with young people when I can to help them. And I just stepped down as Chancellor of Keele University, which I did for 10 years, which was great, which would connect me to a lot of the higher education kind of context for sustainability. Thank you. And you have opened up various um, <laughs> cans of worms yeah, no, that I was <laughs> going to bring in anyway, I can assure you, but you've, uh, you've got to start down that route. Um, anti-nuclear campaigning, uh, corporate connections and so on. Yeah. But let, let's just start, if we could, with a thumbnail bio. Just for your information, the audience is very diverse. Yep. Um, we've got you know, something, I think it's just under half that probably are in this country. But then uh, we do go out, obviously, on the internet as a podcast. Uh, two, um, four fifths of our uh, audience is actually podcast. Um, and about 20% then YouTube, but it's around the world. Yeah. And they've got varying uh, levels of knowledge about, they're all pretty knowledgeable, but they've got varying levels of knowledge about UK politics or about you know the, the minutiae of any individual issue. So talk, talk me through, you were a, uh, I introduced you as a, a, a founding or a leading member of the UK Green Party, even before it was the Green Party, is that not mm -hmm. right? Yeah, no, I joined when it was still called the People Party. And the People Party then became the Ecology Party, and the Ecology Party eventually, bless it, became the Green Party. So it had to go through a number of different changes. I didn't know it was called. Yeah, sorry, I didn't know it was called the People Party. Yeah, <laughs> the original founders um, weren't into ecology per se, but they were definitely into demographics and population concerns and impact on natural systems. So people just seemed to be the the title that popped up most easily in their deliberations. Okay. Um, the reason I kind of jump on it, because it's very, you know, the, 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 there are connotations of um, egalitarianism, socialism, all sorts of things that now come along with the people's this and the people's that, people's republics and so on. Yes, it wasn't really that. I don't think social justice featured terribly large in the early days of the um, People Party. It was more to do with the comparison between the sheer number of human beings on the planet and planetary resources. It was really pre-limits to growth kind of stuff about exactly what those impacts are going to look like. So it was more people's princess than people's republic? It definitely wasn't. It certainly didn't have any, any sort of streak of deep, subversive politics behind it. But it was, yeah, it was pretty radical for the time because actually even talking about these things at that time was pretty radical. Okay, and then in... 1984, you wrote a book which was called Seeing Green, Politics of Ecology Explained, uh, which is a fantastic segue because, of course, green politics has become heavily identified with the left, at least in the UK, not everywhere in the world, but, but certainly in the UK. Um, was that what you were writing about? Yeah, it is what I was writing about. And that combination was very explicit in most European green parties, in fact, particularly with uh, in Germany with Die Grünen, which was deeply imbued with principles from the left and very strongly with the anti-nuclear weapons and anti-nuclear power movement. And in those days, most Green parties were explicitly leftist. There would be a, a cliche rolled out from time to time when people felt, oh, this is getting a bit uncomfortable, which is we are neither left nor right. We are ahead, honestly. It was just completely meaningless. I don't think Green parties in Europe have really ever held much attraction for the right wing. There is a lot of commandeering of green ideas now by right wing parties and um, eco-fascism, unfortunately, is a problem we're all going to have to deal with. But there was never any serious right wing engagement in green politics, in green politics in the 70s and 80s. And you say that, 
but it may be we maybe need to get into definitions of we certainly need to get into a definition of eco-fascism yeah but what because you know there is a entirely parallel narrative which is one that i somewhat ascribe ascribe to which is actually that um some of the most rapid progress on environmental issues has come not from the left but actually from the right so whether it's the clean air act in the uk whether it's margaret thatcher in 1992 at the earth summit uh, whether it's the national parks in the us these were not uh, pushed through by the left they actually came from traditions on the right um, but then it may be a difference between what you call right wing because i you know I, I just sort of there are so many different there are there are corporatists on the right and uh and there are you know uh, the, the you know, agrarian parties on the right or, you know yeah, tendencies yeah, on yeah. The, there's all sorts of things on the right but you use the word eco-fascism so you need to define what that is at the very least we're seeing today quite a deliberate attempt by right wing and often deeply authoritarian, I would call them sub fascist parties, to lay claim to certain aspects of the green diaspora of ideas, particularly a xenophobic focus on immigration and the degree to which countries and civilizations are at risk because of the huge surge in the numbers of migrants from one country to another. And if you look in both the US and in many European countries, particularly former USSR countries, this link between protection of the environment and anti-immigration is now very explicit. And they're using it very deliberately to try and bring people in from different political persuasions. I wouldn't say that it's a strain of argument. Well, here in the UK, you, no, you, not. you do a little bit. You kind of, oh, they're, they're building over the countryside because of all the immigrants. You do get, but it's a tiny yes, voice. It's not a big, thing, a here. Voice, not a big yeah. thing here in the UK. Yeah. But in um, European countries, particularly former Eastern European countries, it is huge. It really is. You look at what the, the fascists, I call them sub-fascists, in Poland, in Hungary, in Italy, now increasingly with this election coming up with this new coalition of right-wing parties um, and time after time what they're doing is pressing the immigration button theoretically in the name of protecting mm. the environment the land the people the folk whatever it might be so a lot of us in mainstream green politics are very focused on that now and aware of the fact that we need to be smart about how we address them i think it, look, i'm very grateful to have to be sensitized to it because it, it's something that i am somewhat aware of but i don't see it as having been mm. as, as being one of the major discourses out there i am aware by the way the risk of sort of spiraling into um, <laughs> you know historical historicism and so on, um that of course you know the the you know, it was the the fascists, the Nazis? They drew on all this iconography around the the Urwald, the the ancient forests, and uh, um, some of the the imagery around sort of dancing naked in forests if you're a true Aryan and so on, um, which which was certainly yeah was so that was certainly a much more substantial theme back then than I see what you call eco-fascism today. It was a big part of it, although to be honest, it was whether it actually touched any of the ways in which they, the Nazis chose to exercise their power is another matter. It was, mostly, it was mostly out there as a kind of romantic trope, looking back culturally, musically, all the rest of it, it but, wasn't really. Although it gets thrown into the discussion as, oh, you well, know, yeah, sort of, yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah, gre the Greens are drawing on these Nazi yeah, traditions of uh, vegetarianism yeah. and, and, and tree dancing. But, but here's, the, here's the question, though. Um, this... The environment um, being bound up through the Green parties with the politics of the left, has that, has that advanced the agenda or has it actually sort of crystallised the discussion and, and made it tribal and actually retarded it, in your view? I think you've got to distinguish between environmentalism, which is a whole suite of activities that are designed primarily to protect the natural world in one way or another, whether it's from pollution or biodiversity concerns, whatever it is, and a much deeper analysis about the root causes that lie behind the damage being done to the environment. So I would be perfectly content with the analysis that in terms of environmentalism, many of the most important interventions by government have come from right-wing governments as much as from left-wing governments. I think that's absolutely clear. 
And in the past, a lot of conservative party politicians in this country would have found it completely acceptable to say that we're very concerned about the environment and would do something about it. And Chris Patton was, for me, one of the exemplars of what green Toryism looked like. But there is such a difference between that and a more root and branch definition of why the economy, as it is currently constituted, based on the pursuit of exponential economic growth indefinitely into the future, will continue to trash the environment, whatever any politician, right or left, continues to do to try and mitigate that damage. And when you get at that deeper level of analysis, there are definitely very strong social justice redistributive elements involved in that politics, which for me are crucial. crucial. I don't believe you can do serious green politics unless you're committed to fundamental redistribution in the global economy and a commitment to social justice right up front in every single aspect of the body politic. Although the focus on GDP and growth is not a right wing or a left wing no, no, indeed and not. And in fact, if you go back to you know oh. the Soviet Union, it was all about we will grow, yeah, we no, will no. match the, what the did, West. And so what on. did Keir Starmer say in one of his... I'm going to sort out my image now and demonstrate that I'm a really decisive and uh, um, well-based politician when he said the, the Labour Party now is going to be focused on growth, growth, growth. Yes. As if he wanted to find a, a, a sort of resonance with Tony Blair's education, education, education. So for Keir Starmer to go straight to growth, growth, growth shows me that the Labour Party, in its essence, which is a productivist, union-based essence, is just as much wedded to progress through growth as the Conservative uh, Let's come back to this in a second, because you wrote that book, 1984, Seeing Green, Politics of Ecology Explained, um, and then you went off and you became director of, the Friends, of Friends of the Earth, but you ended up also chairing the Sustainable Development Commission, and that's where you really worked a lot on this question of growth. Is that correct? That is correct, yeah. So when Tony Blair... <laughs> He was under a lot of pressure at that time because he made a lot of appointments which were deemed to be a bit too close and friendly to him. So the phrase Tony's cronies this was, was being used a lot. Sort of dipping into it's Goldman Sachs to, all, for, for his uh, <laughs> economics team, those sorts of things. That sort of thing. So come the year 2000, I think I put my, my name forward as a prospective chair for the Sustainable Development Commission, which was a completely new um, body that had been a precursor but operating in a very different way. Um, and I honestly think that this determination to be seen to be not beholden to his cronies was what was uppermost in his mind. And he was guided at that time by a number of other people who said, well, you know, he may be a member of the Green Party, but he won't be doing Green Party stuff while he's chair of the Sustainable Development Commission, which I didn't for nine years. Um, <clears throat> and probably we need that level of robust critical friend presence in the government today. So, uh, you know, fair play. They went ahead and they made the appointment. I don't think Tony Blair ever regretted it. I think John Prescott did. He endlessly got pissed off with the commission for pointing out things that he thought were inappropriate and unnecessary and critical. So you don't buy into the John Prescott as sort of champion of the environment, <laughs> 1992, <laughs> banged no. the heads together, got it done? Nope, I do not, funnily enough. Although I love the way history often gets rewritten. Okay, but so you worked at the so one of the one of the initiatives that you worked on was called was the growth was was Sorry, was yeah. on Sorry. was on growth Absolutely. and it was um, it, it was uh, it, it turned into you then encouraged Professor Tim Jackson yeah. to write um, what was it prosperity without growth prosperity without growth question mark question mark so when, <laughs> I can't I mean there's no it, it, it sounds so peculiar here but when extended negotiations with the Treasury, who were really cross about the Sustainable Development Commission bringing out this report, but obviously we were a completely independent body. In the end, we, didn't, we did not give in to any of the changes they wanted made in the text. And so the compensation that, they, that we gave them was that it, the title of the report would be Prosperity Without Growth? Question mark. When Tim Jackson, Professor Jackson, then went on to publish the fuller report as his own book, because it was almost all of his work, then he dropped the question mark. Well, I, I, I'm glad you said that, because I've read his book. Um, <laughs> I debated him on the BBC, on Radio 4, 
And um, so I read his book, which was, um, it was painful going because I found um, some of its assumptions just, well, they, they're not, not I found, they were just wrong. Um, so it starts with this whole, uh, you can't have infinite economic growth on a finite planet, which is, um, and then, you know, there's a whole tradition, um, George Eshku, Rogan, uh, Herman Daly, uh, you know, who, who have repeated this, um, Rifkin, Jeremy Rifkin, they have this kind of pseudo thermodynamic reason why you can't have economic growth, which is based on um, essentially fake thermodynamics. And we have a big ball of energy in the sky that could power molecular recycling. We know it can work because nature does it. So you start with this kind of, you know, you start with everybody sort of nodding wisely and agreeing you can't have infinite growth. Um, and I'm not particularly but, worried know, about the, whether the principles of thermodynamics are or are not breached by virtue of one's commitment so, to economic growth. I think that's an interesting. So can we have infinite? So can we have infinite growth then on a finite planet? If you mean by that a continuation of the kind of growth that we've had for the last seventy years. The answer to that question must be not demonstrably be no. Agree. Agree. I mean, it, by whatever you do, if you just take a look at what growth in its current form is doing to the planet and the speed with which it but, is doing it. But it's the physical aspects of that that is doing it. It's not the economics of it. It's the physical. It's, it's the fact that we mine more but, and more. But we don't have we don't have a model of economic growth that isn't based on massive material throughput in the economy. It doesn't exist. And indeed, much of what if you don't mind the same, yeah. people like you are advocating for, which is the electrification of pretty much everything in the economy, depends on a level of mining, which will actually pretty much wipe out the rest of the bits of nature that are left. So I don't yeah. see any yeah. anything at all in the growth, in the advocacy for continued growth as a way of getting to the point that we need to get to, that has actually taken on board any of the lessons of the last 70 years at all. I've seen no serious attempt to internalize cost made by any government anywhere, to be honest. I've seen no serious attempt to treat biodiversity and nature as something of intrinsic value in and of itself, regardless of its use to us. I've seen no serious attempt to force polluters at every level to pay properly for the continued pollution they do. In fact, if anything, Michael, you know we're going in the wrong direction in that regard. So where to start? Because that, uh, that, that now, first of all, I would disagree uh, with quite a few of the statements about uh, what we have and haven't seen. Um, you know, emissions have peaked and are declining on an import adjusted basis in OECD countries. Right. So we know that this can happen when people say when you say, uh, no, this has never happened. It is actually happening. It's happening in the OECD. Not, I didn't not, say that. I didn't say that. It's so, never happened. I said but on but, the whole, we have failed on, to internalize the externalities of our growth model. We have uh, achieved some decoupling, that is for sure, particularly in the OECD, but that limited decoupling does not give us a trajectory through to a stable climate, let alone a stable no, global but, economy. But I have to be very careful because I don't want to oversell what has been achieved so far, right? But you know, what I will say, a few, a few data points, the UK economy is something like 85% services. So this idea that all, you know, the kind of, you know, um, the Karl Marx idea of an economy that it's essentially about adding value to stuff, and then it's a zero sum game between all the participants in the economy, I just don't buy into remotely. Um, more and more of what we do is actually uh, about intellectual property and services. Um, emissions have been flat since around 2011 right this is never talked about in green circles it's almost never talked about in any well, circles think... but we have achieved uh, during a period when we've had economic growth and we should come back to gdp and what growth looks like but in the period of the last um 10 years we've seen something like an increase of 25 percent in gdp and only a couple of percent increase in emissions so the idea that everything is sort of spiraling out of control, I don't buy into. And to your point on mining, um, we are going to be, you know, any sort of transition um, is going to require an enormous amount of minerals and metals. There's just no question. Um, the idea that it will sort of strip mine every last piece of nature, though, is not true. And at the same time, we'll be enormously reducing 
the amount that we extract in terms of we fossil will. fuels and uh, and and you know steel for pipelines. And, you know, there's just fascinating things out there which are not part of the public discourse. Like forty percent of all ships and shipping actually do nothing but move fossil fuels around. Yeah. yeah so true. the shipping industry, yeah. which is so big, doesn't need to be that big. And I think once we I see a long-term trend towards circularity. In the, in a sense, it's the cup half, you know, glass half full, mm. glass half empty. We will be mining an enormous amount of minerals and metals, but luckily, those are things unlike gas and oil that you can coal that you can recycle. So I subscribe to the sort of David Attenborough view that you know we've got to kind of get through this pinch point, mm. and we will end up circular. You know, and 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 things will be fine, and then we can have hundreds of thousands <laughs> of years more uh, uh, humans enjoying themselves. I I admire the uh, confidence. I was about to use the word optimism, oh, which I suppose is what underpins that. I'm not sure how confident I am. I think I can persuade myself okay. that, it, that, it, that that it is um, a vision worth fighting for. Yes, I can't, and that we are myself. somewhat on track, but not fully on track, yeah. not remotely. I can't persuade myself of that because I don't believe that we will be able to do that efficiency, circularity, minimization of physical impact fast enough to offset the continued pursuit of economic growth and perhaps even more problematic, the, the way politicians use growth as a substitute for genuinely achieving progress in society. And I'm, to a certain extent, there's a there's a much deeper issue here, is that growth has become the only way in which politicians can offer the prospect for better lives, better society, better communities, for progress as we saw it. And just like we have to decouple our economic well-being from emissions of greenhouse gases, so we have to decouple our notion of what progress means for 10 billion people from the automatic assumption that progress will only come through economic growth because if that's if that stays as the core assumption for the future of humankind on a planet which is definitely a little bit stressed out michael at the moment then i think no amount of of um shiny technological optimism will get us through that pinch point so let, let me split that into two issues um one is what do we define as growth but the other is a defense of gdp which i'll come to um, the first is, you know, I, I equate growth and human progress, not growth in GDP, but growth. I actually think that the, the, um, the definition of growth that I ascribe to is actually an asset based one. It is our, our, um, what we need is, is it, an increase in our uh, physical infrastructure, an increase in our natural capital, an increase in our intellectual capital, an in increase in our social capital and an increase, because actually these things do correlate with happiness, our financial capital as well. And so if you know, it's kind of a balance sheet rather than a PL version of, um, of measurement that, um, and, and there, are, there are plenty of people working on it. Cameron Hepburn was actually the first episode on, uh, on cleaning up, working on a full set of capitals that we should be measuring. So if politicians would say, Right, I came into power and we had this much forestry and we had this many motorways and we had this many, um, you know, this many artists, this many teachers, and I want to leave office with more. I don't think we would be disagreeing that that is a sort of growth no, that we no, can no, subscribe no. to. Yeah, no, I'm very comfortable with all that. Um, when Forum for the Future launched in 1996, we launched on the basis of a five capitals model of what prosperity would okay. look like. So we have been based in that sort of area for nearly the last 30 years. So it's not that for me, I'm completely comfortable with. The idea that politicians understand that, or that the politicians are any, not just in this country, but anywhere, are prepared to think about a different dashboard. I think David of, Cameron went to a focus group once that talked about it. Don't be so cynical. It's honestly, that's, that's probably, mind you, the best summary. But really, they, they will not budge from this notion that as long as you are looking after the, as you put it, the manufactured infrastructure, physical capital, and the financial capital, the rest will kind of look after itself. We'll kind of make do with the rest. We know we're depleting natural capital at an unsustainable rate. Right. There's simply no discussion about that. Political efforts to address that over the last 20 years, well, since the Earth Summit in 1992, 
And let's face it, been utterly pathetic, a complete failure from top to bottom. There's been no progress on the Convention on Biological Diversity, and it looks to me as if we're not even going to see much of a new biodiversity treaty or an update on the treaty coming into play this year. Social and human capital? Hmm, bit of a mixed picture. In many respects, the lives of many, many people have improved very significantly, that's for sure, but not universally and not to the degree that you could say this is a gently rising curve for more than, I believe, 20% in humanity. I don't see a gently rising curve for most humans on this planet. But that's not what the data, the data shows, you know, incredible improvements in uh, whether it's whether it's health, whether it's life span, whether it's women included in the workforce, uh, uh, whether it's the the you know, education, whether you, agree. All, all of the major indicators show hundreds of millions of people benefiting and extreme pol extreme poverty um, we have to see how the statistics go during we COVID and, and the last do. few years. The extreme poverty yeah. story is still pretty but, extreme, Michael. But, and it depends what you mean by poverty. So if you if you go from the whatever the minimum income expectation might be today, which is four dollars fifty, and you take it to as Jason Hickel has pointed out, if you just say ten dollars a day, let's go with that. Ten dollars a day, probably you would accept might be a reasonable figure for the lowest viable income level to sustain people with dignity, there are today more than 50% of people on this planet at less than $10 a day. So for all the stats tell us that we're healthier, happier, living longer and better educated, I'm sorry, I don't believe much of this stuff pans out in reality in many of these countries. So it, I'm glad you brought Jason Hickel into this because um, of course, he, he had this huge spat with, and I'm trying to remember the name of the founder of um, Our World in Data, because um, <laughs> because you know, what, what he says about the, you know, the, the oh, you kind of can choose some other measure of poverty, which is going the other direction, turns out not to be the case. Um, and and the, But the bigger problem is the jump from that statement to what a lot of people... Um, I'm, I'm going to be have to be careful not to use disparaging words like in this kind of you know sort of climate lefty blob. But a lot of a lot of you know, I'll go for it. it. But a lot of it, the, the immediate jump then is to degrowth. It is that the therefore the number one thing we need to do is to actually um, reduce GDP because you know if the problems were caused by a bunch of folks focusing on growing GDP, then you have to focus on reducing it. And if you look at the work of, and I'm trying to remember his name, the founder of, um, of, of Our World in Data. Um, but anyway, and, and his spat with Jason Hickel is that the only way that you're going to increase the, um, the, the, the wealth and the outcomes and the happiness and the, and the health and the education and, and so on of those very poor is by doing two things, raising the mean is it, it, there's you can you can you can try and redistribute or you can raise the mean and redistribute yeah. it's a question of the, of the mix of the two but you cannot achieve anything like decent lifestyles for those people without raising the mean without raising the mean if you just try to do it through um crunching big achieving sort of um danish levels of egalitarianism know, know, worldwide I'm, you end up with still yeah. enormous numbers of people incredibly impoverished yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm not disagreeing with that. I've never argued for, for degrowth. It's never actually been part of my advocacy for what we need to do to sort out growth. And had you found points of agreement with Tim Jackson rather than points of disagreement, Michael, you would have found that Tim in that book and in his subsequent writing has said very clearly, before we jettison our dependence on economic growth, we have to answer some absolutely critical questions. One, is what are we going to do about very poor countries who clearly have an expectation of improved material well-being, which is wholly legitimate? Two, what are we going to do about investments and pensions in particular, where people's expectations are built up unless you've got a mechanism for doing something about that? And three, what do you do about public services? So Tim, the book is quite careful because it doesn't, prosperity without growth is not a model of degrowth. It is not a model of degrowth. It is a model which says, firstly, we've got to get growth much more accurately 
characterized for the good things it does and the bad things it does. We don't do enough of that. Secondly, we've got to have lower levels of economic growth. Tim has argued that uh, we're probably in that now with secular stagnation in the economy. And we may well be in a period of permanently low growth in Western economies anyway. So maybe that's the answer to that. And thirdly, you do have to address the redistribution story because without that, I don't believe any raising of the bar, as it were, at the lower end is going to do the job. But it's a bit disingenuous, isn't it, to kind of, you know, to launch these vast broadsides against growth and then say, but it's not about degrowth. So what if it's not about, you know... And, no, not and necessarily, the, no. The, if you, no, stable state economics means that you're not actually... You know, degrowth implies, as you quite rightly said, that we will aim by policy intervention to see GDP reduce year on year on year. Whereas if you hold a certain level of GDP constant and then you improve everything that you you would want to improve in society without necessarily looking to one two three four percent economic growth every year that is not degrowth okay. where it falls down though is and i wanted to come back to gdp my defense of gdp is that humans are smart and we invest and we build infrastructure we get better at doing things and so steady state Actually, if you have a steady state of activity year in, year out, you will be reducing the number of jobs in an economy. And jobs, correlate, so another way of putting it is that jobs, job creation, correlates with GDP. Because you can go into all this kind of, you know, sort of um, uh, very worthy, woke, oh, well, you know, some of these jobs are not worth having. But the fact is, growth in GDP correlates with jobs, and jobs correlate with self-worth, they correlate with the ability to make life choices. They correlate with happiness. It correlates with all sorts of things. And so if you had to choose one metric that would maybe not appeal in, how can I put it, you know, um, Richmond, Islington, Notting Hill Gate, where we are, uh, Cheltenham, but might be really important in the rest of the UK and certainly in, in countries that are trying to better their economic uh, you know, situations, GDP growth is a pretty damn good proxy for what you want to achieve as government. But what if you put the emphasis on the jobs rather than the GDP growth? You say quite rightly that GDP growth correlates with jobs. It does, that's not the only way in which you could increase the labour intensity of an economy. So dig a hole, fill it in and expect people to be happy? And there are many, many things we could be doing far more of. For instance, if you look at the whole care or social side of the economy, we are massively under-resourced from a human point of view in that side, not infrastructure, but on the actual side of looking after human beings in terms of health, social care, community concerns, education. We're massively under-resourced. If we were really serious about growth in jobs, it makes a great deal more sense to think of that as the priority rather than a lot of in my opinion, highly damaging, physically damaging infrastructure growth is the only way of getting your GDP going. But, so I think that that's then, it, that's then just the tyranny of, and I, I, I agree with you that I would like to see much more, you know, um, better health care, better senior care, better mental health, lots of things. But to say that um, we don't like your focus on GDP because we want to have some sort of set of unelected commissars decide what would be a much better set of GDP. And, you know, jobs, no. job, we're, we're going on, to have... Hang on, hang on, you're being a touch tendentious there. I have surely not. not. Said surely not. I have not said unelected. I do not subscribe so to you. So you. you were elected as chair of the uh, Sustainable Development Commission? No, heavens above, no. But the so you were, on a, you were unelected? Of course, but that was an advisory role. It's not an executive role. We couldn't do anything far, far from it. All we could do was advise politicians who were quite reluctant to do anything we suggested. I've never said anything about the alternative to doing this through democracy. And if people who subscribe to the kind of ideas that I have are unable to make that case effectively and persuasively through the ballot box, then that is the reality I have to accept. And that's been absolutely central to my political life, Michael. I've never deviated from that. So I'm not talking about unelected commissars defining what will or won't constitute progress or growth. I'm not in that space whatsoever. 
Um, I think we should move on because we could go down that that rabbit hole of of essentially those people who are against growth are actually for growth as long as it's the sort of growth that they uh, that they approve of. Um, but I want to come on because you know you've also you made a decision to engage with business in a way that a lot of people who would share otherwise your concerns have not. They just think that business is evil. You appear to believe that a lot of businesses' practices are deeply evil. And yet you have, I don't know, engaged. I mean, you are non-executive director of Wessex Water. No, non- I was. I'm was. Non-executive okay. director of Wilmot Dixon. Wilmot Dixon now, uh, since 2008, and a sustainable retail advisory board for Marks and Smith. I mean, these are quite good gigs, are they not? I have loved being a non-executive director. I really enjoy being a non-executive director of Wessex Water. And it taught me a lot about the water industry. Shame things have gone downhill so much since then. And I enjoy very much being a non-executive director of a construction company, which again teaches me so much more than I could possibly get about how construction and contracting operates in this country. So for me, these are really important experiences. Those two things have nothing to do with form for the future. Mm -hmm. I mean, all my fees for whatever I do go to support um, form for the future outside of that, those uh, non-executive director worlds. So the, the basic thrust of your, of your line of inquiry, if I can put it like that, is that is there not some deep compromise involved in working with large businesses? Well, thank you for articulating. I was, <laughs> I was being much too polite. I should just come out and say this. Stuff. Um, it's not an easy one. I, to be honest, it's, it's as difficult now as it was when we set the form up. And there were three of us, and we were all ex-Green Party. Well, I'm still in the Green Party, but my co-founders, Sarah Parkin and Paul Eakins, were both ex-Green Party. Um, we brought a radical intent to that, although as a charity, we had no party political involvement, obviously. But the idea was to bring those radical thoughts into the heart of business through the advisory work and the critical friend role that we still play today. I don't resile from that at all. If you take a realistic view of what the future holds for us, business, big or large, it's going to be fundamental to getting us to where we need to be. So unless you're an absolute purist and you say that all these businesses are going to have to collapse and we will rebuild the economy from the ground up without any corporate structures of this kind, unless you're one person who subscribes to that view, which I absolutely don't, then you've got to accept that business will be significantly involved in our success or failure in getting through to a sustainable future. So once you buy into that, pragmatically speaking, you've got to buy into the idea of trying to make them as good at that job as they can. All right. So you wrote a book, your first book, 2005, Capitalism as if the World Matters. Third. Um, sorry? Was that your third book? Yes. Hmm. I, 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 I'll have to Very complain nice. to the editors at Wikipedia. You will, you will, because you already mentioned my first book, Seeing Green, but there you are. Oh, yes, 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 you're right, you're right. So you've got C in green, I thought that was your, I thought this was your, anyway, never mind. Never mind. You wrote an important book called Capitalism as if the World Matters. What was the number one change that you advocated or that you would like to see? Um, you know, how do we make businesses actually price in these externalities? Those are two different questions. And, and I, there is a chunk of that book looking at the role of corporates, undoubtedly and what they can do within the rules of the game as they are defined by governments. They don't define the rules. They either comply with them or they abuse them. But the rules are set by governments, either democratically or autocratically. So for me, I've always been very alert to maximizing the scope of a business within the rules of the game and then urging that business to be involved in thinking about how to make the rules work better for humankind as a whole, not just for the elite of the world today, for whom those rules are largely designed. So the forum's advice is what can you do within those rules and how do you push further to encourage others then to make a more challenging um, approach to this work. That doesn't get rid of the need for politics because if you don't change the rules of the game, even the best companies in the world can't do what they really should be doing. And cost internalization by companies to the extent they become uncompetitive, where they lose an advantage they might have, you can't ask companies to do that. 
Okay, so you just can't. let me rephrase the question though. I want to come back at it though, because I phrased it as what sh- you know, what what's the one thing companies should do? Or what, but actually, that's not, you're right. That's not the issue. The issue is what's the one thing that we should all do <laughs> to make companies do this stuff right? Whether it's civic society, whether it's governments, tell us the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm very old-fashioned in this regard, Michael. I am absolutely convinced that this has to be done by regulation and through standards and through the implementation of the rules that we have as to how these economies should work. And we've moved so far away from an acceptance of really smart regulation today after at least 40 years of deregulatory zeal driven by right-wing ideologues in the US and the UK. Including Tony Blair, who was on this program. Indeed, including Tony Blair. I think something around episode 50. I uh, couldn't agree with you more. The Labour Party at that time got badly corrupted by the notion that you could step back from intervening in the market and allow the market to do more of the heavy lifting. But he had the third way. Yeah, he didn't. He (laughs) talked about it on cleaning up. He did have the third way, but that didn't entail a shift in the balance of power by putting government back into the frame. So let me give you a concrete yeah. example, okay, because I think people just miss the point of this unless you make it concrete. So back in 2010, the Consumer Goods Forum, perhaps the biggest and most influential body of companies in the consumer goods world, manufactured through to retail, made a voluntary pledge to ensure that all their supply chains would be free of deforestation by 2020, within 10 years' time. By come 2020, not a single company had achieved that. Not one of those pledges had been achieved. We've now got a cohort of companies that have made voluntary pledges to do it by 2023. In my estimation, only one company will get there by 2023. That will be Unilever. The rest will fail again. The vast majority of members of the CGF won't get there before 20 years later. Now, what is the point of that? In the meantime, forests have been crashing down all around the world. If you had governments that regulated for this and you had a set of legal instruments which put you at risk from the perspective of your fiduciary duty if you were seen to be importing or using products sourced from uh, deforested areas, it would change the rules again. The UK, good for them, have actually done it now came in last year, 2021. We will now see a shift in that. They've introduced this regulation and the EU for once is following in the footsteps of the UK. This is such a weird thing to say because it hardly ever did happen and it certainly won't happen in the future. So you have to intervene. If in 1990, the governments of the world said, Solid, this deforestation thing is really problematic and we're gonna create here a minimum set of conditions for trade in forest-based products. Sorted within what, five years? Yes. Levels of deforestation massively reduced, notwithstanding the fact that politicians get elected occasionally, of course, want to reverse this, uh, that legislation. So the voluntary principles on which corporate best behaviour are based are, to me, hopelessly inadequate. Now, I'm trying not to go down the rabbit hole of giving you a long list of areas, for instance, <laughs> climate change, I just uh, decarbonisation, where the UK is actually leading by far, has been leading uh, the EU, but never mind, I won't do that. What I will do, though, is to ask, is there not a risk? So you've got these sort of author- authoritarian liberal democracies, which will, are the ones, the only ones that are going to follow, potentially follow your route. And they could all be enormously um, virtuous by banning all sorts of things. So you could have the EU, UK, in some order, You could have Canada, maybe the US, depending on how things play out there, and maybe a few places like Japan and South Korea. And then you're going to have the Indonesias, the Malaysias, the Indias, the Bangladeshas, the Chinas, the most of Africa, the large parts of of, of Latin America, Brazil, Mr. Bolsonaro, absolutely not going to do that. They're going to regulate uh, in the way that you want. So don't you just end up with a two-speed economy of sort of virtuous Eloy and then sort of evil evil Morlocks just destroying the planet? Well, you'll certainly get a bit of that. But the regulations, the rules have to be completely fair so as not to disadvantage your own economy in Europe and America, whatever it is. Oh, which is a get-out-of-jail-free card, is it not? Because that oh, means... Yeah. Border tax adjustments, for instance on exports of steel from China will be the single most instrumental effective way of stopping China with its utterly reprehensible 
oversupply of cheap subsidized steel into the global market. If you don't have a border tax adjustment for that around carbon, what happens? So is that your number one policy recommendation? No, no, no. no. It is a, it's an important recommendation. I'm just trying to give you concrete examples. So America has a really surprisingly strict rule about not accepting imports into America from countries which are not able to guarantee an end to slave labor and child oh. labor in particular. The palm oil industry in Indonesia and Malaysia is far more worried about that regulation banning, potentially banning imports or exports from them, imports into the US of palm oil, than they are about any number of NGO campaigns, which they basically know are pretty irrelevant. So if the US can do that, why couldn't every single country do the equivalent? So the countries that want to take the lead, they then got to make sure that those countries that don't want to follow are sanctioned and their economies will suffer. Yes, sorry, saying this out front, up front, if they don't follow, take that lead. So I'm an advisor to the UK Board of Trade. And um, you're, you, so I'm, I'm interested in your, uh, your advice. Should we, A, focus on banning bad stuff in trade, whether it's uh, palm oil, deforestation, uh, and so on? Or should we focus on accelerating trade in all the technologies that actually have a chance of moving us off fossil fuels? And uh, Why is that neither or? Well, I'm just interested in your view of which, because you've focused in on border tax adjustments and all these bad things, and I'm worrying about how do we get more solar panels, more batteries, more smart meters, more um, more more HVDC cables, more of all the yeah, things. I want all of those too, but well, probably not as much as you do, because I don't want, to, for instance, I don't want to see a great burgeoning successful electric vehicle sector. I don't want a billion internal combustion engines to be replaced with a billion EVs. So for me, it's very clear I'm not going down that path. But I don't believe these things are mutually incompatible. I want to ban the bad stuff, yes. Because if you don't ban the, the bad stuff, particularly on issues that we obviously won't have time to talk about today, but you think about animal welfare issues, if you're not thinking carefully about what you will or won't allow into the country from the perspective of the appalling conditions under which so many farmed animals are subject the conditions are subjected to, then you're not doing right by the expectations of your own citizens. So for me, banning is an important part of it. But it doesn't mean to say I'm not interested in accelerating the technology curves elsewhere. Do you ever get accused of sort of neo-colonialism of saying, well, you know, because we have these animal welfare standards in the UK, you must have them in 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 India and uh, and Indonesia and Thailand and, and all the places. Almost where you certainly, I get accused yeah. of that. I don't really, I don't really care. Okay, well, that's very honest. I, I've got one other topic I want to open up because we're we we are <laughs> uh, we don't have infinite time. Although we could, you know, you and I could certainly use it. Um, and that is coming closer to the energy transition and particularly actually coming back to um, events in Europe, the Russian yeah. invasion of Ukraine and the handbrake turn that is now happening, ha that is yeah. being undertaken uh, by all European economies, particularly Germany. This is a very long intro to the question. Have you changed your mind on nuclear power? No. No, but then... Let me give a caveat. Many Germans have. Well, two thirds of them now support. Yes, but uh, let me just give a caveat. The, okay, yeah. so when Germany decided to close down its nuclear reactors well ahead of their end of life, I was totally opposed to that decision. I thought that was completely mad. Although the Green Party was very vocal about this, I said these are probably the safest, best run, most efficient nuclear reactors in Europe. What is the point? of pushing that part of your total energy economy out of the mix and needing therefore to go almost certain to fossil fuels as you keep bringing up the renewables and so on. So I was not in favor of that. Would I have supported keeping the nuclear reactors open that they could have done in Germany after the war in Ukraine? Yes, I would. Keeping existing nuclear assets open as long as they meet all the safety requirements, et cetera, makes a great deal of sense. So I am not 
some purist in this respect. It's the notion of building new reactors, which is so totally bonkers. So I'm, I'm slightly amazed because in my, you know, I, uh, researchers, I didn't come across any statements from you that said that I you, can send um, you my blog. And so I will, and I will, I will happily read it. In fact, what we'll do is we'll put a link to it in the show notes because that's what we do. Um, so you would be in favor of keeping them open. If they can still be salvaged, they, they can still be kept open. You would push for that? Uh, in Germany, yes. Yeah. Yes. Belgium? I'm not familiar with the Belgian situation. Switzerland? I, I don't know. You Sweden? Be, you have to be a tiny bit careful. UK? Michael, before, well, what are we keeping open in the UK? Well, we've, we've got some that are very, uh, very definitely are near to the end of their career. Um, you want to keep yeah. those open? Well, no, I'm asking you. No, I would, you can only do this once you've established minimum safe operating conditions right and in those countries i'm not familiar with what the right. so the, safety the, UK, regulator. the uk's old magnox are a little bit um sui generis they're of their own type but around the world we've got a lot of nuclear and it, it doesn't have a natural lifespan these are not it doesn't just sort of it, it, you can actually prolong lives you can prolong uh, lives. and you can prolong lives you know that were originally 40 years, you can prolong to 60 years, you can prolong to 80 years. Well, happily, Michael, neither you, can you nor I are nuclear engineers. Uh, this is a very good thing to do. So ha I am not, Happily, I am. A, you're not a nuclear engineer. I was trained as a nuclear engineer. Were you? Yeah, yeah. Back, back in the day, Sorry. back in the very <laughs> okay. ancient okay. distant past. Okay, I take that back. Yes. Bloody hell. Um, that explains a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, but my sort of rule of thumb here is each of these countries has sophisticated safety regulators. They have to be independent, as they are in France and Germany. They're less independent now in the UK as a consequence of some of the changes made by Conservative government of the Office of Nuclear Regulation, much less independent. As long as you can guarantee the integrity and independence of your safety regulator of the nuclear industry, maintaining the life of an existing nuclear reactor up until that point where its safety can no longer be guaranteed, makes sense. Okay, that's that's good. And I and I, I I'm very I once drew a two by two matrix of where nuclear was okay, and it was kind of you need a whistleblower culture and no earthquakes. <laughs> and, and, and then, you know when you get that area but you know luckily lots of europe is in that and, and canada and places like it um but then the question is you've now accepted keep them open you've accepted life extension if somebody comes along with a technology that says we can now build new nuclear that will be safe that will be economic and that's where i have my issues but if it could be done what's the difference existing maintain its life or build some new what's the problem what is the problem with nuclear surprised to know michael but i've always said that if all these smart people in the nuclear industry could come up with a reactor design that actually met all the conditions that i have for um, making nuclear power relevant in this world then society would need to look at that with an open mind i've always said that it, when i was director of frontiers we actually said if the industry can come up with answers to these problems, itemize all the problems, including cost, but also waste, safety, et cetera, et cetera, then we should not have an a priori ideologically based approach to nuclear power. This is an industry that fails year after year to come up with anything which will meet those criteria, anything. And you would be in favor of funding them to research those options? I have said or... that it is fine for governments to include nuclear technology in its research budgets subsidizing development is different okay uh, again i'm i'm um you, you'll send me your blogs on this and we'll include them in the show notes because you know you are on the record of as criticizing friends of the earth for failing to campaign vigorously against nuclear. correct no, look i'm still 100 anti-nuclear so you are 100%. Of course I am. Okay. Because, look, if you look at what they're offering us today, what the nuclear industry is offer, offering us today, either big reactors or small modular reactors, or even, God help us, the idea of a fusion reactor at some point down the line, none of it adds up. It doesn't add up economically. It doesn't add up from the perspective of managing our waste problems. I don't believe it adds up in terms of its role on new energy grid systems. For me, 
I then get into the whole story about proliferation, about safety issues. None of it stacks up. So, of course, I'm 100% anti-nuclear because there's nothing in the nuclear kit bag which makes any sense to me whatsoever in comparison to all the alternatives that we've got. Now, we had on episode 94, Julia Pike, who's the financing director for Size Will See, and <laughs> she, of course, would be, uh, a, we'd have an equally charming discussion, but she would disagree vigorously with those statements. Um, but um, we we'll probably sure just... Would, as long as she gets permission from government to go and fleece UK taxpayers or consumers to get the money they can't raise anywhere else. Because your words on size will see were just the latest nuclear scam. Indeed. I'm afraid that is my conclusion. Very good. Well, what I'd love to do, uh, we'll have to think of a format where we can get you and Julia yes. uh, to talk about size will see. Indeed. Um, meanwhile, we'll put the links into the show notes. And uh, sadly, Jonathan, we're out of time. So thank you so, so much for Pleasure. joining me here on my sofa in yeah, front of you my union, privileged. Jack. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, Thanks. Good. All the best for uh, you know, your, your continuing advocacy for the planet. Thank you. So that was Jonathan Porritt, longtime environmental campaigner, green politician, and founding director of the Forum for the Future. My guest next week is Professor Chris Rapley, He's the Professor of Climate Science at University College London and former director of the British Antarctic Survey and the Science Museum. Please join me at this time next week for a conversation with Professor Chris Rapley. Cleaning Up is brought to you by Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation and the Gilardini Foundation.